question can we follow to experience revival? Men and women are God's method. Revival, like any spiritual reality, involves human personality. The call is to obedience, to follow Jesus, whatever the cost. God is looking for people who will let them go, let themselves go, and dare to be fools for Christ. God can do more through one man, who is 100% dedicated to him, than through 100 men, 90% dedicated to him. Half-hearted, weak need, compromising obedience, will never cha challenge a sleeping church to rise up and rescue perishing souls from the jaws of hell. We have disciples' hearts. Are we disciples? Do we follow Christ? Are we Christ followers? We're disciples. Now, I'm pretty sure when God made us, he didn't put us on the earth and say, have a great time, do whatever you want. Just, I'm so happy that I made you. I hope you like the place. Just, you'll be okay till I come and get you to bring you home. I don't think so. I think he put us here for a reason. I think he wants us to be disciples. Okay, that's um, one that accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines or something thought as a body of principles. We have to pour out our life as an oblation. That's an offering or act of sacrifice. We have to be that person. The spark that ignites the church, renewal. We are his church and we are his people. But Jesus is revival. Jesus is revival. We can't do it, but we can sure work at it. We can pray for it, do whatever he says. There's a lot of things that he would want us to do before he pours out his spirit on this church or any other church. He's revival. We can't do it without him. All right, revival is the take on of a new life. I already said this, but I'm saying it again. Because if you forget and come and ask me, I'm not going to remember. So I'm telling you again, so I'll try to pay attention. Seriously. It's reawake, restore, freshen, flourish. And the word flourish is to thrive, to prosper, and succeed. But I'm talking about preparing the word and succeeding and doing what we are commanded to do. I mean, we sure did have a lot of commandments and laws. It's invigorate, invigoration and arousal. We have only Jesus to think that we're here today because he woke us up this morning. A lot of us might ask, what course of action can we follow to experience revival? Revival, like any spiritual reality involves human personality. Men and women are God's method. The call is to obedience, to follow Jesus, whatever the cost. I know that sounds like a heavy, but it's um, the truth. As his disciples, of course, as a follower of Jesus, God is looking for people who will let themselves go and be fools for Christ. Now, speaking about a revival, we never really, just maybe a couple of us saw a real, a real flooding of the spirit. That's a real revival. So it, it's kind of hard to explain. But um, we can't have any doubt that he wouldn't come 
in his spirit and just water us with his spirit. God can do more. Oh, I already read that. All right. Where am I? See, I, I don't have my uh, bookmark. All right. Half-hearted, half-need comp compromise of obedience will never, will never challenge a sleeping church to rise up and rescue perishing souls from the jaws of hell. Disciples' hearts are ones that accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines or something as tough as body of principles. I already read that, but I repeat myself sometimes, so... We have to pour out our life, I already read that too, as an oblation, okay. So, in Genesis 1, 27, here we go. I'm just going to read the um, footnote. Men and women are both created intricately, exquisitely in the image of God. Many have heard that statement and even quoted it. The difficulty arises when defining what being created in God's image actually means. God's image involves the spiritual more than physical. God is a spiritual being, and as humans created in his image, so are we. The human spirit can commune with God's spirit. Humans created, created in God's image can exhibit godly char characteristics, holiness, righteousness, and justice. The verse that follows Genesis 1, 28 to 30, explain the importance of this image in the creation context. Human beings are... you. you uniquely fitted to rule creation as God's imagine bearers and as his representatives. We are called to be his representatives. I mean, we are called to witness the people. Some people never heard of the name Jesus. And, you know, if, if you happen to meet somebody, just say a little, just something, you know, you know, like even a God bless you today, you know, I, I just hope that God blesses you today. You know, you, you'll know right away if they don't want to hear it. You, you know, God will shut your mouth. He, he really will. But you know what? That's to be expected when you try to minister to somebody or, you know, tell them about God. But that's what we have to do. He's our Father. We have to let them know about our Father, and he expects it. Their superior position allows them to use and enjoy the creation, but also carries the responsibility to uphold and protect it. Okay. What am I doing now? All right, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God had seen the sinful people. Oh, okay, this is in 6, 5. 6, 5 through 14. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved. He had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals, and creatures that move along the ground, birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man blameless among his people, people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Did I say that right? Now the earth was corrupting God's sight and was full of violence. 
I know people don't watch the news too much in here, but I do. And every day somebody's getting shot, robbed, beat up, you name it. Yeah, it was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. Oh, it's, it's, it's a lot of corruption going on. But for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Everything, oh, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark. And I'm going to read a footnote. The human race veers away from God. Rulers develop harems, signaling sexual dis dissipation, while wickedness, and the in 6.5, uh, I, I, I read, but um, criminal acts that violate the rights of others and violence. 6.11, acts that intentionally, intentionally damage others are rampant. In the midst of this wanton scene stands Noah, who is not only righteous, but is also living blamelessly among his neighbors. His neighbors were not very good. Peter 2.5 describes him, Noah, as a preacher of righteousness. He is busy telling others that a judgment day is coming. No wonder God is pleased when he sees Noah in the center of rampant sinfulness, living faithfully, righteously, and evangelic evangelically. I can't say that word. You know what I mean. And no wonder God's word, inter word interrupts its depiction on debauchery, to declare. But Noah, let's see, 6 8, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Six eighteen. Did I read 6 18? I did. Okay, now I'm going to Exodus 2 24. Okay. Moses and the burning bush. In Exodus 2.24, the story of the Israelites begins its dramatic turn from oppression, fear, and slavery in Egypt to miraculous deliverance by God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God's intervention in their plight is more than an act of compassion. It's also an act of faithfulness. Oh, God, he is so faithful. God has made promises to Israel, patriarchs, to Abraham, to Isaac. That's um, in Genesis 15, 18 through 21, 17, 3 through 8. And to Jacob, that's 17, 21, 26, 24. The time has come for God to do what he has vowed. The texts say God remembered his covenant. Not that, that, that does not mean that God's forgotten his promises and now suddenly recalls them. His timetable is ful fulfilling his promises is perfect. During the time of their oppression, God had multiplied his people. Now he will make them into a nation, give them a land of their own, and bless them, just as in our lives, God sees everything. Proverbs 5.21, he keeps his promises, yet he's not bound to any timetable we set, but only to his own perfect timing. We know that. We want it today. Lord, I prayed about this last night. How come nothing happened today? Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. 
flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see that this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to, the look, to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. That should be something for us. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Here I am. That's what I thought. I could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot. Now, Exodus 3. Oh, I did that. One, two, four. Um, Exodus 20. Sorry. Wait a minute, I'm losing myself here. Okay. Okay. Exodus 20 was the Ten Commandments, kind of like plumb line, where God wanted people to walk straight perpendicular, and so I won't go into that because I already did about the Ten Commandments, and there's more than Ten Commandments. We know that there's 600 and something laws. Okay, next comes Matthew. Okay, Matthew... This is a, a, all right, his genealogy is 1, 1 through 17. His birth, 1, 18 through 25. Jesus' early life is in Matthew 2. Jesus' baptism by John is Matthew 3. All right, the beginning of the beginning of his ministry is Matthew four, one eleven. And Jesus begins to preach in Matthew four seventeen. Jesus preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. Some of us have to do it every day, repent of some reason or another. <laughs> we better, right? Okay. The last passage in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, well, name of the Father and the Son, but we know it's in the name of, because he does have a name. His name is Jesus. We know that. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of age. He's telling us as disciples, go tell people about him tell people about him. They have to know because there is a dying generation right now out there. I mean, I hear Irene saying about the schools, what they're teaching them in school. You, you don't feel like being a girl. You don't have to be. You don't want to be a boy anymore? That's okay. And it goes on. The list goes on and on. That's a dying generation. That's the devil on the loose. We all know he's a liar. The last passage in Matthew's gospel, known as the Great Commission, records Jesus' final instructions just before his ascension. The verses are dominated by the word all. All authority, all nations, 
all things. It's translated everything. All days here translated always. His command to go is based on his sovereign authority. In his resurrection, Jesus becomes the one through whom all God's sovereign authority is presented. He's the king. He is the king. Resting on his authority and power, we go to the nations, baptizing them in the name of the triune God and teaching them all that Jesus said. His commands will not change. His word never changes. The same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that. They will remain until the end of the age. But marvelously surpassing his command is his promise that he will be with us as we fulfill it. Now, we have to for sure not have any doubt of anything that God can do. No doubt, because there's not a thing that he can't do. Nothing. Now, I know, well, we know, we cannot be the ones that bring on revival. But, not only, not Jesus, I mean, not only Jesus, but he has stipulations. Things that we do, praying, praying is the, is the biggest thing. Praying is the biggie. That's all there is to it. Prayer is the biggie. But it's a corporate thing. If, if we want this to happen, we have to do it corporately. And that, that, that's all there is to it. We have to be in sync with each other. Repentance. We certainly have to repent of our sins, you know. We have to put God first in our life. We can't have an excuse of, well, why we couldn't, you know, do this and do that for God because, well, because it's only an excuse. Years ago, I, I, I wrote a book about excuses. If anybody wants to know, I'll tell you. But anyway, um, to know that he is going to be with us till the end of age, it's a wonderful thing. So, we've been having prayer time on Wednesday nights. Um, and like I said, we can't doubt anything that God will do or can't, you know, can't do. He can do all things. I believe with my whole heart that there will be a time that he will have, we will, we will have an outpouring of his spirit in this house. But not until, not until we obey his laws, his rules, his commandments. It sounds like such a hard thing to do, but it isn't. It's not. I mean, um, I really and truly stopped saying that word, the other word, female dog, I did. I stopped saying it. I really did. I repented, and I haven't said it since. But I haven't banked into walls either lately, so that's pretty good. So anyway, next week was going to be my last week, Stephen. Get ready, honey. Next week's my last week. And we'll talk about revival. What does that mean next week? So you, yeah, are you ready? You're getting ready? The only thing we have to do is remember that we're here for a reason. Don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed. Don't feel stupid. Don't. Don't be afraid to go up to people. It doesn't matter what you say. I mean, just, you know, well, it does matter what you say, but God will lead you. I'm telling you the truth. And, and, and I know I mentioned this before because something else that I, I had said, but my favorite places were Stop and Shop and Walmart. And I, for you know, a long time I'd be there and I'd be, and I didn't care, I would just stop people. 
Uh, I would, you know, and I'd say, you having a good day today? And they'd look, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, good, I'm, I'm glad. I said, God is good. And then I would go. But if they stayed around for a minute, I'd say a couple more things. If they thought I was a crazy lady, let them think whatever they want. I am, I'm crazy. I'm crazy about the Lord. He's my father. Anyhow, next week, like I said, will be my last week, and that's what we're going to talk about. Okay? Just don't have any doubts of what he can do. Now, think about this. I know everybody has heard this before from somebody, but think about a person in, in a trauma room in a hospital that's been in a coma from an accident or whatever. I've heard of, and I know you have, people, there have been people that were in comas for six months and woke up. Six months, okay? So, for us praying about God showing up, his spirit showing up in, in our church here, I mean, it could be next week, it could be six months, I don't know. But all I know is that if we pray corporately about the same thing, and we repent of our sins, it'll happen. I believe that it will. I believe it with my whole heart. You want to know why? Because Sister Fran said two words, plumb line, and got me going. Any other time that I shared, um, it was not like this time. I feel like it has a meaning, a real meaning. God really wants our attention. I believe he's speaking loud, very loud. Look around. And I don't mean just Christ-like fellowship. I mean, and I'm not talking about the COVID either, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just look around. See what's going on. People, they're, they're crazed. You know, it, they really do need us. They need us, and so does God. He didn't make us to just enjoy life here on earth until he was ready to take us home. He wants us to do a work, a job for him, like he did for Moses. Moses was the man. Anyway, I could go on and on, but I'll save the rest for next week.